What's going on, Thrones fans? This is a Throne Runner back again with another deck building video. Um, it's been a, a while since we've had a deck building video, and the reason is because I tend to enjoy building a deck and you know testing it out, be it on Octagon or uh, in live matches, in order to make sure that the deck is actually decent before I start. Uh, sending it out to the masses, it would suck if I would just three crafted a deck and said, "Oh yeah, this is the bee's knees," and sent it out and had all of you guys get torched trying to play it. So my apologies for that. Um, this deck that we're working on today is actually an update of a previous deck building video that we had, which was the uh, Stark Attrition deck, which was a Stark Fealty deck that only used core cards, obviously because there were no packs out at the time. However, now we're fortunate because we are two packs into the cycle. Um, for those who are unaware, the Road to Windfall just released, and myself and Rob over at Rob's Gaming Table, we did a pack review of sorts. Um, we unboxed it and discussed each of the cards one by one over at Hobby Kingdom. So that was a really good experience. If you haven't seen it, uh, feel free to check the video out. Video out. There's going to be a link at the bottom of the channel, and I'll do my best to get one on screen if I can remember, um, so you can go and check that out. But the reason why I bring that up is during that review, and despite the look on my face as we went over the cards, um, I really fell in love with one of the cards that were released out of House Stark, and that is the Kennel Master. And so I decided it would be fun to kind of build a deck that focuses around the Kennel Master and all the things that he allows Stark to now do because you're, you're able to weasel around and, and kind of throw your opponent off, uh, mess with their math a little bit. So I think that's why I enjoy the Stark deck so far because it has a little bit of scum to it. Uh, when you throw in the Kennel Master and, and, and his abilities. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and jump straight into that deck. Like I said, it's House Stark, um, and we're doing the Fealty for new players or people that might not be aware of, of the Fealty agenda. Uh, you cannot include more than 50 neutral cards in your deck. Action, kneel your faction card to reduce the cost of the next loyal card you marshal or play this phase by one. And so it has a lot of utility, a lot of uses. Uh, new players don't feel like you should only you know, banner your house with a different house because the fealty agenda is very strong and there's a lot of uh, strong decks that utilize it. So let's jump right into the deck building. <clears throat> because this is a deck that we've discussed before and uh, the game is, it's not old by any means, but it's it's been around for a little bit now, so I feel like I can spend less time um, discussing each individual card. Uh, so I'll do my best to to not spend too much time on, on individual cards for you veteran players out there, but for you new players, I will still pop it up on screen, and if you do want, you can just simply pause the video um, if I don't spend enough time on it. So Arya Stark is a staple in pretty much every Stark deck, every Stark deck, not pretty much, uh, because of how much utility she has. She gets that military icon whenever she's duped. She already has uh, stealth. And she's a lady, so you can get her out for very cheap with a noble cause. And she has that reaction where, you know, if you marshal her out during marshaling phase, you can take the top card of your deck and attach it to her as a dupe. New players, don't forget that if you play her in setup, you cannot trigger that reaction. Okay, so we've got Arya. It just makes it very easy to push through challenges when your opponent has a bigger board or some heavy hitters on the board. You can stealth pass a 16 strength Tywin because it doesn't matter. He's not going to be able to contribute if you choose him for stealth. So she has... Uh, an unbelievable amount of potential and use no matter what the board state is in my opinion so that's Arya. next we've got three copies of Bran and the reason why Bran is very important for Stark players is because we don't we I'm a Greyjoy player Stark does not have a lot of money um, and that makes it very difficult for them to block multiple events um, in the combat phase or in any phase, multiple events are going to affect them negatively. So Bran affords you the opportunity for two bucks in marshalling to put him down, and now you have a little bit of buffer. You can you can kind of ease off a little bit and not have to worry about being Dracarist because uh, Bran is there. And so that immediately changes your opponent's strategy. Now you have to think, well, what can I play first to burn Bran in order to get my real event off? And... Uh, you as a Stark player will probably have a hands judgment just waiting in the back pocket so you can block two events at once uh, for the price of one, essentially. So Bran is very good. I really like him. Some decks only run two. Me, I run three because I find it difficult to find uh, slots for 
the hand's judgment. And I mean, if you're just sacrificing Bran, he's not going to your dead pile. You can keep playing him over and over. So I would suggest three, unless you change the deck up and manage to fit in multiple copies of the hand's judgment. Uh, next, we've got Caitlyn Stark. And while Caitlyn Stark is participating in a challenge, your opponent cannot trigger card abilities we'll talk a little bit more about that later but essentially what this means is that when caitlin stark is participating in challenge your opponent's not gonna be able to trigger or play any events that have bold words on them so if it's like a bold reaction or whatever those all count as triggers and now your opponent's not able to do that so you can do some pretty interesting things if i don't know caitlin gets a military icon and has ice on her and you're worried about a treachery or something like that uh it affords you a lot of options, you as a, as a start player, and it takes away all the options for your opponent. So keep that in mind as we move forward. But a very, very good card. Only play two copies. You don't really need three of her. Uh, her cost at four is pretty high, even though her ability is great. Um, I just found that three was a little bit too much for the deck. <clears throat> Next, we've got three Direwolf Pups. I used to hate on this card so much. Uh, Direwolf Pup. As you can see, cost two, has a military icon and one strength. However, it gets plus one strength for every direwolf that's in play. That's including other direwolves, or sorry, direwolf pups. That's including Summer and uh, Grey Wind. And also includes the attachment Lady because Lady as an attachment does have the direwolf trait. So these guys tend to get very strong as the game progresses or whenever you drop them on the table, really. And they really don't cost much. So I would suggest three because it's a deck that revolves around the direwolves, excuse me, and all the things that they can do, uh, you definitely want three of them in your deck so that you always have one on the table. Um, moving forward, we've got Grey Wind. And you notice we skipped over Eddard Stark. In previous versions of this deck, so going back to even two days ago, I was playing one single copy of Eddard. For whatever reason, I kept seeing him. Like, I'm pretty sure I saw him in, in almost every game and got him out on the table in about three quarters of those games and he did cause a lot of trouble for my opponent especially when he had um a little bird on him to give him that intrigue icon but i just found that i was too worried about getting edited out on the table versus setting myself up for a proper victory it's great to have edited out for seven have him stand for all these cha whenever challenges initiated and the fact that he has renown on him but i just feel like Unless you really, really want that one copy in, you don't necessarily need it. Maybe some guys who like to play 62 cards, you throw that editor in. I stop at 61. That's my magic number. Um, so for now, there is no editor to start in the deck. But we go straight to Grey Wind. Grey Wind is great. When you get him out with Rob, it's a free kill. Not quite as good as the uh, spoiled Sir Illin Payne, which is just ridiculous. But you're still able to uh, kneel Grey Wind in the challenges phase. And kill a chump character of one strength or if robs out you can kill a character of two and there are a lot of great characters that only have two strength in the game uh regardless that makes it feel like every military phase of yours is to claim if you're able to pop gray wind off um in those turns not only that but gray wind has intimidate so if you're the first player and you swing heavy win a huge challenge um you can kneel one of your opponent's big guys so lots of utility out of gray wind it does cost five which at times can be difficult to play, but I find if I see him, I'll put him down uh, regardless because it is, like I said, a great card to have. Next, we've got <laughs> Maester Lewin, and I've got a funny story about Maester Lewin. Hopefully, I remember it before the, de the uh, deck build is over. Um, Maester Lewin, three costs, another Intrigue icon, and some power, uh, two strength, and while you control him, Rob Stark gains insight, and we got Rob in the deck, and Brand gains immune to opponent plot effects, and Brand is also in the deck. So your opponent, um, it's not like they're really going to target Brand for anything until a card comes out that says, I don't know, blank a specific character or something like that, which they wouldn't because we've got fortified position. Or maybe they would, I don't know. Either way, uh, there's not really that many plot effects that are going to affect Brand too much while he's on the table. So I... I kind of play him just to have, you know, a fourth character if my opponent decides to wildfire. It's nice to have that out uh, because wildfire is simultaneous. As far as I know, wildfire is simultaneous, so all those characters are dying at the same time. So regardless of if Maester Lewin dies while Bran is on the table for a wildfire, Bran would still be immune to the plot effect as Lewin dies. And so you'd end up with four characters 
out on the table instead of three. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, that is the ruling. Um, on top of that, we don't have Rickon yet, and we are not bannered with uh, Night's Watch, so the Jon Snow and Rickon aspect don't count. But for Rob Stark, the fact that he has Renown now and Insight, if you've got two of these guys out, uh, it's it's very nice. It's very, very nice. Um, again, there's only one copy of, Mace, copy of Maester Luwin, but for whatever reason, I seem to see him very, very often when I play games with this deck. And I make sure to get him out on the table because of how nice it is just to have his... Uh, his effects on Rob and Brian Stark throughout the game. So that's Maester Lewin. Next, we got one copy of Rattleshore's Raiders. This is one that, you know, I've recently put it in. I don't really care for it too much. Um, this is what I replaced Eddard with, actually. And the reason why I replaced Eddard with the Rattleshore's Raiders is because out of Stark, there's no real way to remove icons, sorry, remove attachments like Milk of the Poppy, other than playing the plot Confiscation. And I know that it's just a one-of in the decks. So you're not going to see it all the times when you actually need it. Uh, and that's maybe part of the reason why I might go back to Eddard, because when Eddard's out on the table now, that's another uh, Milk of the Poppy target anyway. So it's kind of, to me, it's kind of the same thing. It feels kind of the same. My opponent is wasting a Milk, not wasting one, but playing a Milk that I'm not too worried about, because if they Milk Eddard, I still got Rob, who has Renown, etc., uh, so I don't know, some of you guys might want to take this out. This is a card that I've kind of been leaning away from as I continue to, to build decks in 2.0. But, uh, for those of you who need that security blanket of, you know, maybe I'll draw a rattle shirts, be able to afford it, win a challenge with it, and then get rid of the milk that's on Rob or Caitlin or whoever. Um, I guess you could keep it, but that's totally up to you. Just keep in mind that this is, uh, this is my flex slot for Eddard Stark. Uh, next, three copies of Rob Stark, automatic. You you wouldn't make a Stark deck without this guy. He has Renown, and after you sacrifice or kill a Stark character, or after a Stark character is killed or sacrificed, uh, once per phase, sorry, once per round, you get to stand all of your controlled characters. So regardless of if they're a neutral character or if they're a Stark character, everybody on your side of the board is going to stand. He is going to eat milk of the poppies like crazy. Um, and that's why I do have the one copy of Confiscation, usually to get the milk off of him. But like I said, now you got the rattle shirts, maybe, to try to get the milk off that way. Um, either way, a very utility card has that synergy with Maester Lewin and has the synergy with um, Grey Wind. So you would never play less than three copies with him. We don't even really need to talk too much about him because everybody just knows it is known. Next, two copies of Sansa, and for those of you who've watched the Night's Watch videos, you're very familiar with her. Whenever she stands, she gains a power for your faction. Just gets you that much closer to winning the game uh, that much quicker. Not only that, but when you pay a gold to move Lady over to her as an attachment, she also stands in that case. And you're able to use to deny the reaction um, at that time, get a challenge off again, wait and see what happens, and then use her re reaction in standing to gain the power. So it's totally up to you. Um, I mostly just have her in the deck as a way to chump block an Intrigue Challenge, lose the Intrigue Challenge most of the time, unless I can pay to move Lady over, and then have her stand and gain a power. So not too much to say about, about her. Just two copies. Three was a little bit overboard. Um, my opponent usually tries to kill her as fast as possible. <laughs> so I found that it wasn't even worth it to, to keep drawing dead cards. Next, we've got Summer. While you control Bran Stark, he gains insight. So if you got Summer out and you've got Maester Luwin out, now Bran is not only immune to plot effects, but he also has insight. And then that makes Bran ever more useful because you know you already know you're going to win the, the power challenge of four or whatever. You just throw Bran in just for that extra one power and to draw a card. Um, not only that, though, but whenever Summer comes into play, you're able to return a Stark character with printed strength two or lower, which is Bran and uh, Maester Luwin. Uh, the Dire Wolf Pups, a whole bunch of other characters in the deck, and return them from discard or dead pile to your hand. So that's how you get the um, the recursion to stop events, is by playing the one summer, and that gives you an extra brand or whatever you really need at the time. If you need to, like, I don't know, recur a Tumblestone Knight or something, then you've got it there. Chances are you're going to want to recur a Dire Wolf Pup over Bran. That's what I found anyways. Uh, because of cards like like Warm Rain and the fact that you're going to be using the pups as your claim soak. Either way, though, only two copies of Summer. Don't really need to have three in the deck. 
I mean, she is just, or he, I don't know if Summer's a dude or not. Can't really tell right there. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> you, you only need uh, one, uh, two copies of Summer, three strength for one icon, and sorry, three gold for one icon and three strength, and that little ability there that you probably won't even pop off too much. And chances are you're not going to get the insight off of Brand that often anyway. Uh, definitely not a card that you need three copies of. Next, we've got Serio. And Serio is one of the new cards from uh, from the Road to Winterfell. And Serio's got stealth. Serio can give a character a military icon and stealth. This is his same ability from the CCG, actually, for those of you who played that. Um, and so now, when we go back to cards like Caitlyn, who makes it impossible for our opponent to trigger, trigger card effects. Now you can start thinking, hey, if I put ice on Caitlyn and Sirius out, then I give Caitlyn a military icon and stealth, maybe have Arya out, stealth two characters, and now Caitlyn is triggering ice and getting that target kill that my opponent can do nothing about, which is an unbelievable feeling. I can't say how good that, that feels when you finally get that off. And I mean, that's not really... A combo that you have to rely on it doesn't have to be on caitlin stark if you want you could play this on maester lewin or uh on sansa even and give sansa a military icon on self and play ice on her you can do a lot of things when cereal comes out it's still only one copy of cereal i had him at two and i found a lot of the games i didn't even need to put him out because of all the other options that i had um in terms of getting different players to proc ice because of lady so he's just kind of in there for fun to mix it up sometimes and, and give uh, Caitlyn that icon. And also, uh, I have him in the deck because a lot of times you do have to use Arya's dupe as claim. In which case, she's sitting there on the board with a power icon and stealth. And you can just give her a military icon for free with Sirio and still get two characters on the board, including Sirio, that have military. And because this is a military-focused deck... Obviously, that's a good thing to have. So he's no by no means a staple in the deck. He's kind of in the deck just as a galvanizer, if you wanna, if you wanna, if that makes sense to you, it makes sense to me. He galvanizes the deck. He's a boss. Three copies of Tumblestone Knight, and there's nothing to be said about this guy other than the fact that he's a knight. He has two icons. He comes in for cheap, and he puts in work. Not only that, he is the store championship. Uh, sorry, not store championship. The Winter Game Night Kit promo. So. Put those promos to use. Three Tumblestone Knights go in. Uh, no questions asked. No questions asked. Next, we get to the big boss. The big boss. I don't believe in playing three copies of him. I said it in the video, uh, in the unboxing video, that I don't believe in playing three copies of him. Even in a deck like this, I still don't recommend playing three copies of him. I've seen people... Excuse me. I've seen people play three copies and i just think that's kind of overboard um i play two because that way a lot of the time you do see it in setup and if not you see it early game because of uh cards like uh gates of winterfell um but let's talk about his action really quick this is a new card so we can spend a little bit more time on this one it's a two cost one icon we don't care about his icon he could be blank for all i care one strength ally challenges action if you control a participating Stark character, kneel a direwolf character or a character with a direwolf attachment to have it participate in the current challenge on your side. Limit once per phase. Very, very strong ability. Like I said, um, now if you have a bunch of direwolf pups on the board, so let's say we had two direwolf pups on the board and Lady somewhere on the board, those direwolf pups are each going to contribute uh, three strength each direwolf pup because of the plus one from the pup from this other pup and the plus one from lady which is also a direwolf and so if you find yourself in a position where i don't know you're blocking an intrigue challenge with just maester lewin who has two strength and you really don't want to lose it because you have winters coming in your hand or a put to the sword or something and you know that you're going to get it off on your challenges now you're afforded the opportunity to kneel Maester Lewin into the challenge because you have to have a Stark character participating already. So you kneel Maester Lewin in at his two strength. You trigger Winterfell Kennel Master's um, challenges action and kneel a direwolf pup as well. And now you're sitting at five strength for intrigue because the direwolf pup doesn't need to have the same icon. It just contributes its, str its strength 
um, as you would with Jon Snow, for those of you who are familiar with Night's Watch. Um, unfortunately, this is something that you can only do once per phase. However, it does mess with the math a little bit. Now your opponent is a lot more weary of the fact that you've got these little pups just just chilling there over in the corner. And uh, and they got to really think about that. Now, the reason why I said you only want to play two and some people play three. The reason why some people play three of them is because they want to have multiples in play, I'm assuming. Uh, because this is a limit once per phase. But if you've got two Winterfell Kennel Masters out, then you can do that twice. So once on your turn if you want, and then once, I don't know, on a military challenge, let's say, if you need to get that little extra bump up to afford to put to the sword or something, then you're able to do it again. So I'm assuming that's why people play so many copies of it. I feel like even though this deck is based around Dire Wolves, um, this is a combo that when it works, it's fantastic. However, I've also played a lot of games with this deck where I haven't even seen the, the Kennel Master, and I've still done fine. So you don't by any means need it to win it's not it's not a necessary it's not a win condition like i need to see Win winterfell kennel master or my deck blows it's not an, a situation like that it's just one that when it's out it makes a deck that much better um not only that but easy claim soak so when it's a situation where i gotta claim somebody i would never claim or i should say i shouldn't say never but majority of the time i wouldn't worry about having to claim the kennel master because i want to save him for his ability it's really not worth it to me I could get him back with Summer if I wanted to, um, but there are other more important characters in the deck. The Kennel Master just makes the deck run all the more smoothly. And so that's... Uh, wait, that's not it. There's a character missing. There is a character missing. Tumblestone Knight. No, Tumblestone Knight's there. Oh, sorry, Winterfell Steward. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Winterfell Steward. This is just a reducer, so three copies. Boom. And we round out at 32 characters. Uh, moving forward, we've got the attachments, and this one won't take very long at all. Two copies of ice. Some people might want to play three. I don't blame you if you want to play three. That's an also, another idea. Drop a rattle shirts for a third ice um, if you think that you really, really need to see it. I think that two is more than enough, me personally, just based on the cost of it alone. You'll find a lot of times you would rather obviously play a character versus getting ice on the board because you need characters in order to even have the ability to trigger ice anyways to win that military challenge. So there's a lot of times where you'll have ice in your hand and not necessarily play it right away. It's not a card that needs to come out as soon as you draw it type of thing. So that's why I feel like um, two is enough. Uh, next, we've got three copies of Lady. Um, one cost, start character only, and it's terminal, but like we said, it's a direwolf. Attached character gets plus two strength. Action, pay one gold to attach Lady to a different character. Then, if attached character is Sansa Stark, stand her, and that is limit once per phase. The reason why I put three copies in is because this is one that you definitely do want to see all the time. Um, there's been a lot of games that I've played against, against Targaryen because of how popular Targaryen is. And any Targ player knows that when Arya Stark initiates a challenge, you Drakaris her. She only has two strength. You get you burn through her dupes. You get rid of that stealth on the board, and now it kind of opens it up for you. You're not so worried about you know playing characters out because of high claim. Now the reason why Lady is very important in this deck, and the reason why I play three of them, like I said, Targ is a very uh, prominent deck build, deck type, faction, whatever. Uh, Targ is a very prominent faction in everybody's meta currently, and there's a lot of Jakaris recursion, and so if you're able to get Arya out with Ice and Lady. She's now at 6 strength, which bumps her out of Jakar's range. And you're not worried about her dying uh, as, soon, as soon as she initiates a challenge. Not only that, but because of her stealth, that makes her a very um, advantageous card to use in a military challenge. Because chances are she might even be able to get a military off on her own at 6 strength. Stealth somebody and win it, and then still get a target kill off. So I tend to focus my Ices and Ladies on her. Uh, but as we've said, because of uh, the Winterfell Kennel Master and because of Lady's ability to pay one gold and move her somewhere else, now you're able to put Ice on characters that your opponent wouldn't guess, like Caitlyn Stark, or I've put it on Maester Lewin. Um, 
and then you move Lady over to one of those characters, initiate the military challenge with whomever, just make sure you've got two characters that way. One doesn't get Jakarist, and then the challenge fizzles. So you put in at least two characters, knowing that one of them is going to stand to get the, the, the challenge off, and then you use the Kennel Master's ability to kneel that character, Caitlyn Stark or Maester Lewin or whoever, to have them now participate, and then they can get ice off after you win the challenge. So the story that I wanted to remember was, I was playing on Octagon last night, actually, and I had Maester Lewin out on the board. I had a little bit of money. My board, my icon spread was pretty good, um, and I decided, because it was a target player and I didn't have Lady out, I didn't have Lady out on Arya or the goal to move her, I put ice straight on Maester Lewin. And I just waited for the challenges phase to pop off. And I got my challenge in. I, I put in Arya and, I believe, uh, just a direwolf pup. And he didn't have Drakars, which was totally fine. Um, but because I was able, because Mace Loon had Lady on him, I just knelt Mace Loon into the challenge. And he was the one that ended up swinging ice and taking out Cal Drogo. So, and that was on a two claim plot too. That was on uh, sneak attack. So, it just, like you can see, it gives you so many different options in, in getting uh, the ice off and in doing a whole bunch of different things to kind of throw off your opponent, change up their math a little bit, and now they're not just, you know, the, the typical flow chart. Do you have Drakars in hand? Yes. Is your opponent initiating a challenge with one character? Yes. Does that character have four strength or lower? Yes. Play Drakars. Now they got to think about more things because that's not going to be the one, the one way out of the challenge type of thing. So... Like I said, it, it makes Stark very fun. Um, there's so many different things that you can do with them now. If you're playing Dire Wolf, sorry, Wolf's Wood, then you're able to ambush Lady in. Previous version of the deck had Wolf's Wood, Wolf's Wood in it because ambushing Lady was just jokes and like, I don't know, man. It just, like I said, it just messes up your opponent's math so much. You ambush in Lady and then you play for the North and that's an automatic buff of four strength. Plus, you win the challenge and draw a card. And if that person had ice on it, even on defense, you get to swing ice now. Like, there's just so much stuff that you can do. And you can't just say, you can't just assume, like, oh, it's Stark, whatever. Um, I'm going to win this challenge for sure. They don't have anything that they can do. It just changes the game up a little bit. And you'll notice that that's usually when your opponent makes mistakes, is when you're able to throw off their challenge math. And then they have to overthink things. And that's generally, like I said, when they mess it up. Or at least that's when I mess it up. Anytime the math gets screwed up and I got to think about it three times, four times, um, that's usually when I drop the ball and make a misplay. Anyhow, let's continue. One copy of Little Bird just to give intrigue to a character. Um, I tend to give it to Rob Stark. That way, uh, when I lose an intrigue challenge, I don't have to worry about him getting blown up by a Tears of Lease. And then finally, one copy of Milk of the Poppy. One copy of Milk of the Poppy. Uh, treat attached characters printed text box as if it were blank. I've actually recently been trying to limit the amount of milks that I play in a deck. Um, I find it to be a crutch, sometimes an unnecessary crutch. In an aggro deck like this one, a lot of the time you're just going to be killing a character before you need to worry about blanking it. Um, I had numerous copies of milk of the poppy in the deck at first and i found like i said like i would milk tywin and then in that same turn i would end up icing tywin and then feel like i wasted a buck playing milk of the poppy because it wouldn't have really changed anything um so new players will probably still hold on to three copies of this in their deck i've reduced it down to one in this deck anyways i think in other decks you're still going to want to play two or three but um, as far as this House Stark fealty deck goes, like I said, it's very aggro. Um, it does limit your opponent's options on their side of the board enough already that you might not even have a target for Milk of the Poppy. So, as always, this is just my version of the deck. If you see something differently or you want to change it up in any way, that's totally on you. Um, there are numerous ways that you can get three copies of this in by taking out characters or uh, even dropping down to two ladies instead of three. Um, so I leave that totally up to you guys. Whatever you see, whatever your meta does, uh, you guys would definitely know better than me. I just know how my group likes to play. So now we get to the locations. Two copies of Gates of Winterfell because Stark has no draw. So being able to reveal a card and challenges 
and add it to your hand counts as draw and you'll find that you'll get lucky and you'll use this challenges action and find a winter is coming right before you initiate your military that you know is going to get through and then all of a sudden you've got this claim two military with ice on the board and two gold lever put to the sword and just like that you've killed four people in one turn so i would definitely include this card in all stark decks um that's the only winterfell card that i would include though winterfell castle for me the this card just came out in uh in the road to winterfell yeah it's kind of meh um it it's really meh actually you how many times are you really going to put two unique start characters into a challenge just to get that plus two i mean for three bucks it's a great ability but for three bucks it's never going to happen i wouldn't i wouldn't do it i've seen decks with it but i don't believe in it so none of that for me three copies of the heart tree grove because it's a stark reducer yes it's limited we don't care we play it anyways and then i don't know what this new uh what this new push is for playing less copies of the king's road or the roads road rose road i f still find that they're definitely cards that you require in a deck economy is so important in this game um and i just don't see why you'd play less than three copies of the rose road. unless maybe you're playing like a lannister or something and you you know you have the money lender who's limited already and you don't want to have too many and you have all these other ways of getting money then fine but in a deck like this um economy is your best friend you really really need to see rose roads rose roads early or any way of reducing the cost of characters to get in because um you do need money to play ice you need money to ambush uh direwolves in and do all those fancy things and move lady around so i would not toy with the economy at all again that's just me and then lastly we've got the road the sorry the wolf's wood each direwolf card in your hand gains ambush x and x is that card's printed cost um as you can see it's not a trigger so your opponent can't play treachery on it it's just a card with text on it and it gives your cards in your hand ambush which cannot can also not be treacheried so don't let your opponent try to do that to you don't don't let them do it throw one copy in like i said if you don't want the wolf's wood take it out and add another milk or take it out and add eddard stark um <laughs> again it's not a card that you that you really really need like you don't it's not going to change the deck much without it but it's nice to be able to ambush in a lady and give that plus two strength and then have a buck to move lady right away to another character and give that character plus two strength um so that's the reason why i have it and it's just one copy because this deck kind of still is in testing for me anyways before i start bringing it to store championships and things so i'm just testing again i've take i put it in and i'm now Sorry, I put it in, I took it out, and now I'm putting it back in just to give it some more testing against different types of decks and see how well it does. But uh, like I said, this would be another flex slot that you could easily interchange for a Milk of the Poppy or um, Eddard Stark, as we said, or like a second Rattle Shirts, whatever have you. And so that's 12 locations. And then finally, we've got the events, which are standard. For the North gives you plus two strength in a military challenge, and if you win it, draw a card. Remember, it has to be on a start character. Like Warm Rain, because we're playing so many direwolves and we're now able to ambush those direwolves in. When you lose an intrigue challenge, you kneel a direwolf character uh, to choose and kill an attacking character on that intrigue challenge. I love to save this for Varus. I love to save this for um, um, Cersei. I love to save this for anyone who, with an intrigue icon that's super annoying. Uh, a lot of people are wise to it when they play Stark and they'll initiate their intrigues with like a little chump, like a handmaiden or something. Does handmaiden even have intrigue? I don't know. You know what I mean? Just one of those little two strength dudes with intrigue um, because they feel like he might have it in their hand. And that's totally fine too because now if I don't have to worry about Cersei, I'll find another way to kill her. So I play two copies of that. Don't really need three uh, because you have so many other ways of killing of target killing characters so two copies of for the north two copies of like warm rain currently this is still in testing two copies of put to the sword because i was finding that with my plots i do play some some high economy plots i was going into challenges having two gold just sitting there uh and then not having anything to spend it on really so having a put to the sword would 
would be a nice, beautiful option to have in terms of spending uh, gold in challenges. We've got a copy of the Hand's Judgment, which I still want to take out as well, but that's just in there as a backup. And then I play three copies of Winter is Coming. Some people play two, but I find a lot of the time it gets intrigued out of your hand, gets poked out, uh, different things happen, maybe one gets fizzled. And so it's always nice to just have backups waiting in your deck or multiples in your hands that you know for sure you're going to finally get that two claim off. That being said, uh, Winter's Coming is a great, great card to use, not just for military challenges. Um, a lot of people kind of hold it and only use it for that. But you should also strongly consider using it on power challenges. Um, if you think about it, you do a power challenge with a claim of one. You play this. Now you're claiming two. If somehow you manage to get unopposed with Arya, for example, um, because of how many characters you're taking off the board, that's two power for claim, one power for unopposed. If Sansa's out, she stands. That's four in one turn. Maybe you win dominance. That's another five. So it adds up very, very quickly. Um, I find that I I usually end up using one for military and then two for power just to kind of push the envelope and win the game that much faster. Uh, I also joked around and played with some superior claim because I was winning challenges, power challenges by so much. Um, excuse me. But I think that this definitely has, Winter is Coming definitely has more utility than a superior claim because of the limitations on superior claim. And not only that, but this card, superior claim does cost zero, but this card here, um, you can reduce the cost of playing it with fealty. So, it just goes a lot more with the deck. So that's the deck there, 61 cards. Like I said, there are a bunch of flex slots in it. For those of you who feel that it's not suited to your playstyle, you could easily gear it and do the things that you want to do. Um, we made mention of Rattleshirts Raiders being one card that you could definitely remove and change to something else. Uh, the Milk of the Poppy, whether you want to reduce it or increase it, you can do so by taking out the Wolf's Wood or messing with the two copies of Put to the Sword because you feel like you don't need it. Maybe you can drop to one and add a second hand's judgment. Uh, lots of options there. And I'm sort of just tweaking those numbers based on what I think I'm going to see in the meta. So like I said, the deck's still in testing. Um, I'm trying to find the sweet spot for it. Just to give you a bit of the numbers on it, uh, it is currently... I mean, keeping track, it's currently 9 and 1 on Octagon. 9 and 1 on Octagon. And then I played it, I believe, three times now in person. And it's won all three of those games. So, very, very good deck. Uh, I forgot that we didn't do the plots. So, we can just do those really quickly. And this is another area where I feel like a lot of players will probably disagree with the plots that I chose. Again, this is just suited to my, my play style and the things that I like to do with the deck. Um, I'll go ahead and just punch them in real quick. A Noble Cause, we all know what that does. Uh, this is a target for Arya. It's a target for Bran, which I don't think you'd ever really spend on Bran. But maybe you would because it's just limiting the amount of money that you have to spend in a turn. Uh, it can be used on Caitlyn. It can be used on Rob, Sansa. can't be used on Syria, which kind of sucks. you got to pay for him up front. But very nice card to have. Considered to be an econ card. Saves you that money for things like Put to the Sword or Moving Lady Around. Um, next, we've got one copy of Confiscation, and that's just for a guaranteed attachment removal. You really want to get that Milk of the Poppy off of Rob this turn. You have an ability. You have the ability to do that. Not much else to say about that. Uh, next, Counting Coppers, actually. Counting Coppers, I feel like a lot of people, new players, not old or veterans or whatever you want to call yourselves, I feel like a lot of, a lot of new players would overlook this plot because they see that you know, you're only getting two gold. Uh, two gold is kind of poopy. Blah, blah, blah. Only three in, uh, initiative and one claim. Uh, not so good. Not so good. But you draw three cards when it's revealed and you draw another two in uh, three cards when it's revealed and another two, two for a total of five uh, when you start the draw phase, whatever. Um, so that's a very, very high influx of cards. You're drawing cards very, very quickly. Um, if you have Rose Roads out, usually I end up playing this around turn 4 or 5 when I do have a couple of Rose Roads out. Uh, then it doesn't hurt as bad because, you know, you're still going to get that 4 gold. Or maybe you have some um, some Heart Tree Groves out to reduce and be able to make good use of that 2 gold. Um, and a lot of the time, because of the way this deck works, you're throwing stuff out of your hand so quickly that you're sitting there at a reduced hand size. Your opponent's going to win a lot of intrigue against you. Uh, so this is just a way to replenish your hand quickly and give you some options moving into the next 
the next round of the game. So I wouldn't overlook this. That could be a flex uh, plot for you, but I really think that this is a card that's important in this deck. Uh, next is one copy of March to the Wall. And the reason why March to the Wall is in here is because a lot of the time your opponent will have a bunch of characters out on the board. You'll gray wind one of them. You'll win a military icon, claim one. Maybe you have Winter's Coming, claim another one. And they've got that one pesky guy sitting on the board because they don't want to claim their Kyle Drogo or they don't want to claim their Jamie Lannister or whatever have you. Um, next turn you play March to the Wall, get rid of one of your weenies. And now they got to march that big guy and you've got a wide open board just waiting for you. I can't tell you how many times that's happened uh where i was kind of like oh dang it i didn't manage to get everybody off the board blah blah, blah. oh wait i got marched and you just march them doesn't matter if you're going to come out on top if you're going to come out on top you play march to the wall unless it's like a reducer then that he has left then you don't want to do that but if you're going to come out on top and it's going to make a substantial difference to your opponent's board state and you know that it's going to tilt them you play that and don't second guess it March to the Wall. Uh, this one here, still working on it. Um, I count it as an econ plot. That's why I still play it. It just really sucks when you play um, Sneak Attack and your opponent plays Game of Thrones. Um, in that case, you're going to want them to go first. And then you're going to want to do your Intrigue Shenanigans with uh, the Winterfell Candle Master And kneeling people into the challenge to help contribute their strength to it. In order to win that intrigue on your opponent's turn and then get your military off. Uh, sometimes I feel like I would rather play Winds of Winter. But then other times I'm reminded that this has five gold. Oops. That this sneak attack has five gold and it helps me get a lot of things out on the board. So, um, I don't know. It all depends on you and what you see in your meta. You might see a lot of Game of Thrones. I'm just saying. So, some fealty decks play two sneak attacks. I don't know how they do it. And they're successful with it. Um, but for me personally, I always seem to guess wrong on my sneak attacks. So I've been making the effort to play sneak attack at the most random time. Well, not really random, but just when my opponent can't afford to play Game of Thrones because they need to play something else or they're worried about something else, then I play sneak attack. Um, you just got to make sure that you don't telegraph it against a deck that is intrigue heavy because you know that those intrigue heavy decks are definitely going to play Game of Thrones and they're definitely going to try to get you to fish out Sorry, they're definitely going to try to fish out that sneak attack from you. Um, next, we've got one copy of Summon. Search the top 10 cards of your deck for a character. Reveal it and shuffle your deck. Reveal it, add it to your hand and shuffle your deck. Uh, utility counts as draw. See a character that you want to see. Not really much else to say about that. Um, everybody knows how important this card is. I rarely see a deck these days that doesn't have at least one copy of Summons in it. And then the last card is Supporting the Faith. And some of you might wonder, why the hell would you play Support in the Faith? Why? But the first reaction after the challenges phase begins, each player returns all gold in his or her, his or her gold pool to the treasure, treasury. <laughs> Against Lannister with Tyrion out, they don't care. To them, it's whatever. I'm going to get two gold regardless. My Tyrion's going to pay for this. But against all the other decks that have no way of making income, uh, during the challenges phase, that could be the difference between a put to the sword on their side and a put to the sword on not your side because you would lose your goal too. But that could be the difference between, sorry, losing two characters on your side versus losing just one when you lose a military challenge by five. Um, not only that, but because you're playing fealty, you're not as worried about losing gold in the challenges phase as your opponent might be because you're able to still kneel your house card and pay for uh, Winter's Coming and raise the claim on this plot by one regardless. So that's why I play it, just kind of to mess with those those types of decks. But fealty is kind of more popular now, and you do see a lot out of Targ. So they're probably thinking the same thing, like, oh, you played Support in the Faith. That's cool. I'm just going to save my fealty until challenges when I want to burn one of your characters down. So again, this could be a card that you would take out and switch with something else. I know I definitely want to switch it with something else. What would I switch it with? Trading with the Pentoshi? Probably not. Uh, maybe a rebuilding? Rebuilding wouldn't be bad because then you could recycle those Winter's Comings. You could recycle some Put to the Swords or... 
um, hands judgment or whatever have you. So there are definitely other options, but currently I like having that six gold in in marshalling um, to help me get that final push. And that's usually a plot that I play late in the game as well, kind of like on the last couple of turns uh, to get that icon spread out on the board to get that board kind of flooded and then go for a final a final push and go for the win. So I don't know what I would have replaced it with yet. Um, that's something that I'm definitely working on in testing as well. But uh, if you have any ideas on what that last plot could be, could be, feel free to drop a comment or fire me an email. A lot of people have been emailing me actually, and you know, just ask me questions, going over decks, and just just shooting the shit, I guess. And it's been awesome, man. So keep it up. Uh, I usually reply to emails like right as they come because they go straight to my phone. So don't feel like you can't email me because you know I'm not gonna answer you because I'm too busy. I'm not. So feel free to fire me an email, fire me a message on Reddit or whatever. I don't know. Just fire me a, a message and uh, we can talk about the deck and figure some things out that way. And as always, thanks again for watching. Thanks again for all the uh, kind words that we've been receiving. Not only myself, but uh, Rob Rob at Rob's Gaming Table too. Uh, it's because of you guys that we keep doing things like this, right? It's very, very easy to keep it going when we've got all these people rooting for us and and just saying like hi to us and telling us that they watch our videos and appreciate them, blah, blah, blah. Um, it really makes it, like I said, easy to continue. And uh, it really downplays the couple of negative comments that we see. So shout out to you guys for, for watching because without you, this wouldn't be possible. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to let me know. And hopefully you enjoy the deck. And I hope to get some uh, store championship footage up for you guys in the near future. Whenever it is that I attend the next one, I think it's in like two weeks. So look out for that. Until then, there is going to be some more Netrunner content. So I'm sorry for those of you who play Game of Thrones but don't play Netrunner. But this is the Throne Runner channel. So I got to feed both audiences. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoy the deck. And everybody take care. Peace.